Panther is within the Aboriginal territory of the Suquamish people of Clear Saltwater or the Suquamish. Expert fishers, canoe builders, and basket weavers, the Suquamish live in harmony with the lands and waterways along Washington Central Salish Sea as they have for thousands of years. Here, the Suquamish live and protect the land and waters of their ancestors for future generations as promised by the Point Elliot Treaty of 1855. And now I'd like to welcome Kristen. Hey, thank you, Taylor. Um, I just want to call out Taylor for a minute because the this job of the job, the privilege of giving the land acknowledgement uh, is something that's really that we take seriously here. It's not just a performative act. Um, it's something that's really meaningful, and um, we are centering you here on this land and encouraging you to think about the um, the legacy of violence that actually has brought us to be here and the privilege of being here together at the art museum. So um, thank you, Taylor. And thank you for uh, the pronunciation. The Lushutsi language is, is really, uh, it's, it's a beautiful language that has a lot of resonance with the landscape and um, calls up the sounds that you hear in the landscape and in the flora and fauna. And Taylor does a really beautiful job of pronunciation and that's meaningful, so thank you. So this is the first time, uh, and I said I wasn't gonna cry, but <laughs> this, is, this is the first time I've been up on this stage and I have not said I'm the Director of Education and Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, Advancement at the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art, and that just all of a sudden that hit me. So um, I'm Kristen Tollefson. <laughs> I'm an artist. <laughs> I'm an artist and educator and longtime Bainbridge resident, and um, thank you all for coming to hear me um, share some of my experience during my five months in Slovakia. Um, a lot of people have said to me really in l such a lovely way, uh, how was your time in Slovenia? And, <laughs> and, um, I don't fault them for that. It was, uh, it took me a long time, really until I was in the country to understand where I was. And it was a 30 year lead up to going to Slovakia. And so shame on me for not uh, getting that a little bit more. But I'm, I wanted to start off with a little bit of context for where I was because um, as it turns out, Central Europe is a little bit of a mystery for many people. So um, here we are in the world, and you can see the star is actually not on the country of Slovakia, but it's showing us the way. And I love this image because it shows um, precisely how central to Central Europe Slovakia is. Let me get a little closer here, and you can see it in the context of other recognizable landforms like Italy and France. And you can see that it is well landlocked, uh, surrounded on five sides by Austria, the Czech Republic, Poland, Ukraine, and Hungary. And I was um, saying earlier tonight, I have about 50 different talks that I, that I could and would love to give. <laughs> One is on uh, why this is significant because the um, geopolitical scene there is um, really impacted by this kind of pressure from all sides. So um, here we are in Slovakia and you can still see the political landmark, the, the outline of the country relative to neighboring countries, but this, map is good because it shows the topography, which is also really significant here. And um, so I wanna call your attention to 
Bratislava, and right over the border, just an hour train ride away, is Vienna. So when you, when you fly from Seattle, you fly to Vienna and you take a train right into Bratislava. Bratislava is the capital and um, it is known as kind of a separate part of the country. It's, it's an urban center, it's a, it's a really dynamic and kind of constantly evolving city. And, um, and then you have the rest of Slovakia and there are kind of two divisions here. There's the mountain range division north-south and uh, the south and its adjacency to Hungary is significant. And then you also have an east-west uh, division. And as you get progressively farther east, you find progressively more influence from uh, Eastern Europe, not Central Europe. So Ukraine is a bordering country and um, you find a lot of politics that are um, more aligned with Eastern Europe in the East. I'm really generalizing here. It's, it's much more complicated than that. But I wanna show you uh, now that you've had a chance to kind of adjust, you can go back here and see the context. We'll go forward again so you can see the, um, the political outline. Apologies for this map, it's not great, but you can still see the border here. There's Bratislava. <clears throat> and this is a good, another good map because it really shows a little bit more of the stark contrast in elevation. So you can see Bratislava has a range of mountains that kind of follow up here and there's this lowland and a river that leads up to Jelena. This is about uh, on a fast train. It's about uh, just under two hours from Bratislava to Jelena and on a slow train, it's like three and a half hours. So um, that is about the distance that we're looking at. Jelena is where I was in Slovakia and go back here to another political map. So you can see where Jelena is. Uh, with respect to uh, the Czech Republic and Poland, it's really far north and it is a very mountainous area. Um, it's tucked in, it's like Missoula in many ways, it's a basin with mountains all around. And um, as you may know, in 1992, 293, there was a Velvet Revolution where the Czech Republic and Sl Slovakia agreeably split from each other, but um, the connection to the Czech Republic in this part of the country is still very strong. So um, here we are in Jelena, and you can see the Va River as it uh, kind of curves up into the city here we go a little bit closer still seeing the where the river is and the floodplain which is real and this is a view from a lookout tower on the outskirts of town on the north end of town looking back down on the va back down in jelena and um, the town where i spent five months of my year last year here's another view this is a view from my office and a little corner of the post-Soviet architecture that I grew really fond of at the University of Jelena. Um, I was on a Fulbright grant, a US scholar grant, to go to uh, the Slovak Republic and do research. And one of the things they encourage is that you are invited by a, an academic institution. And um, when I applied, the application process was really logical. It, it just kind of flowed out of me. It was stuff that I'd been thinking about for so long. But I had been working for many years to try to make contact in Slovakia and had never received a, an email response to my emails. So I had some help from the Slovak uh, Fulbright office to make a connection here in Jelena and um, so I was housed at the University of Jelena. This was my office uh, slash studio. And this is the university from outside. And I love this um, the sculpture <laughs> too. This is, I, I love this picture actually. It, it really does a good job of showing the drama 
um, that one feels coming up to an academic institution in, in Slovakia. But, um, so much more about that. So this is, so I was in the humanities department, humanities and mediamatics. Uh, mediamatics being kind of a version of marketing and communication and design all melded together. And um, so I was there for five months working in that office. Every day I would go to work. And um, what was I doing, you might ask? <laughs> So I thought about a bunch of different ways and points at which I began. And um, arguably, here's, here's one beginning. Uh, this, a beginning of a prehistoric gesture of a wearable piece of artwork um, that was found in Hungary. So not, not far from where I was. Um, however, this was not my beginning. My beginning really was uh, Ramona Solberg, who was the uh, lead of the jewelry metals department at the University of Washington for many, many years. And um, I never met her, but uh, her work was extraordinarily influential to me as a young person in college and out of college who was really um, had no idea that there was this intersection between learning about culture and learning about art and bridging that with people. And so I just want to bow down to Ramona Solberg for being uh, an influencer for me. Um, so it wasn't that I started at a beginning in time and chronicled my way, charted my way through this kind of linear narrative, but it was more that I started where I was and reached to a bunch of different places. So Ramona Solberg was only one of the influencers for me. Uh, Alexander Calder, an obvious one. Um, this idea of making something from nothing was very appealing to me. It was kind of part of the ethos that I grew up with. And um, really being creative with what you had Arlene Fish is another um, important figure in the textile and metal co um, continuum. She wrote a book that uh, textile techniques in metal that I had used for years and years and years in my teaching. And only fairly recently did I um, come to know that she had been the recipient of multiple Fulbrights to multiple countries um, where she learned about, took photos of, um, studied, and compiled for her books information about ways people were using, uh, kind of overlapping with textile work or fiber work and metalworking. Ruth Asawa, uh, she is, I mean, thank goodness she is known now, but when I started practicing, uh, she was not as widely recognized and um, definitely a huge influence in my work. And, um, you know, as I have continued to work, I have been really looking for people who embody some of the qualities that I found originally in the wire work. Um, Mark Dombrowski is a Tacoma based artist who is very interested in repair and um, this idea of making, again, making something very different out of nothing. Uh, Simona Yashinova is a Slovak artist who is borrowing very um, clearly from practices around historical wire work and bringing them into her contemporary work. So the foundation for my work really was all of these influences, all of these people who I was exposed to as a young artist coming into uh, creating my own practice. Um, however, <laughs> um, the reason that I ended up in Slovakia was uh, really prompted by this book, which I received as a gift in about 1992, shortly after it was published. Um, it's about a little eight by eight inch 
kind of, um, you know, it's a design compendium. It's, it's a bunch of really cute pictures of uh, wire work that had been collected in um, flea markets in Paris mostly. And uh, I, it, was, it was really, I, I, was, I loved it. It was a really good book. Um, this photo was in the front of the book. It was not the thing that I would turn to all the time, but um, it lodged in my brain. It was a photo taken from the Museum of Culture in Žilina, Slovakia. And um, the book was great because it contextualized the work in the book by talking about the origin story of how wireworking came to be. And um, so the quick overview of this is that uh, these are, this is a tinker. And um, a tinker, the tinkering community uh, is, has a very strong origin in the region, the mountainous region in and around Jelena. Um, it's not a hospitable climate for uh, agriculture and in particular uh, times where the seasons were kind of in uh, shift seasons, people were not able to do work on the land there. Um, it also happens to be a, a really deep mining area, and so there was a natural resources, resource that was available to, um, that, that coincided with this need for working. And so you can see, uh, this is, this is kind of a quintessential photo of a tinker um, dressed in these leather shoes that had straps wrapping around the ankles, this kind of uh, homely, uh, coarsely woven garment. You can see that um, the, his skin is pretty leathery looking. He looks like he's been sun exposed. And he's sitting there with a crockery pot and his pliers and a big spool of wire. Um, one of the jobs of the tinker was to go from town to town and repair crockery and glassware because those were expensive commodities at that time. And uh, repairing them, uh, either reinforcing them or actually putting them back together was a really important job for people in non-wealthy, non-urban areas. So they would travel on foot from town to town and um, they would practice their repair work. And you can see here a detail of um, a little bit decorative uh, repair work, but it was, it's a stitching method. It's using wire to twist and stitch and loop and using the, the wire to the best of its ability. Um, over the course of time, I'm gonna give a, this is a really compact version of the story um, with the Industrial Revolution, wire became, the production of wire became mechanized where in the past it had been made by hand using a draw plate and um, was really time consuming. Um, during the Industrial Revolution, these kind of small businesses popped up and then became bigger businesses in Russia and Poland and even immigrants to the United States, especially in, again, really mining rich areas like uh, Pittsburgh and uh, Chicago, I think was about as far west as, the real, as this was concentrated, but um, it became a mechanized process. A lot of um, utilitarian objects were made. This is from a Parisian catalog, kind of like a Sears Roebuck catalog or a Tupperware catalog and um, all useful things like bottle holders, um, egg containers, milk skimmers. Uh, there are really no shortage of utilitarian objects and um, they quickly started to take on characteristics that were um, whimsical and decorative and uh, sculptural and Soon you saw this kind of transfer from purely functional things to things that were decorative and some that were very um, over the top decorative. Um, there's more to this story, of course, uh, and it involves the socialist period and how people couldn't have cottage industry and work at home and how the industry almost 
fizzled because of that. And, um, and then it also involves a conversation around the kind of resurgence of an interest in craft and art and the intersection of those things. But um, what I was doing was really trying to figure out how this practice related to what we, who we are today. How, how does this traditional practice of a craft, which is really rooted in this kind of functional um, conversation, relate to me as an artist or art or a conversation about contemporary life? And I, I had some ideas, you know, I, I thought, well, these are kind of pre-itinerant workers. They're pre, um, you know, nomadic workers who can work anywhere. Um, they would go out to different cultures and they would come back and bring information. They would bring language, they would bring food, they would bring garments. Um, there was this kind of pre-globalism that, that happened with these people. They were always coming back home. They were always really celebrating their families and bringing money and, and actually physically returning when they could. Um, this idea that I mentioned before about making something from nothing and how that relates to um, how we work in the world today. You know, we're exhausting supplies. What do we think about art that is about repair? So these, these qualities started coming to the surface for me as I was preparing my thoughts about going to Slovakia, but um, there was a big difference, or there, were, there was some difference between what I actually encountered and what I was thinking. Um, this is uh, Budatin, which is the castle, the, it's the castle of Jelina, and it's actually across the river in a, a little kind of suburby area, but um, it has its own history, but it is the home of the, national, of the regional museum of wire working, and uh, it's got an entire gallery space dedicated only to wire working. And um, uh, just a side note, the library in Jelina also has an entire shelf dedicated to drotarstvo, which is the, the Slovak word for wire working or tinkering. Um, so it was really good I was there. <laughs> really good I was in this, in this place. Um, the, the hall has, a the, there were a lot of things, like the greatest hits were there. Um, all these functional objects that I'd seen in the book, they're, they're there in the gallery. Um, I loved that there was this photograph. So uh, same guy, but we have a little more information now. This is, um, the information that I learned, which is they, the tinkers did not travel alone. They usually had an apprentice, and it was usually a really young person not related to them who was learning their craft or, you know, kind of helping them out. So um, this was confirmed in a variety of photos. They had um, some stage, this is definitely a staged photo, but um, there, were, there were a lot of, there's a folk, uh, history that surrounds the idea of the tinker, and um, they they were really looked down upon initially. They were seen as um, kind of shiftless. They didn't have a steady job. You know, they had to travel. They had to come back, and they were, you know, bare feet, and you know, didn't shower all the time. And so there was a lot of um, hostility toward this group of people. Um, I suspected that there was a connection between the Romani and um, the, which is an ethnic minority that came up from uh, India and has uh, it, lots of people derogatorily call them gypsies now, but the Romani are an actual cultural subgroup. Um, this is the only photographic evidence that I found. This is from the Romani Museum in Brno in the Czech Republic of a Romani tinkerer. So I had all these ideas that I thought were really gonna match up, but they didn't all, not all of them went somewhere. Um, the museum also showcases some of the uh, attributes of the tinkerer. This is the, this is the backpack that they would carry, and it's like a portable workstation, kind of like a shoeshine 
set up um, with a lid that opens up and has tools in it and straps and everything else gets strapped on to the outside. Um, here you can see some of the things that they might have had just ready-made for sale, like an, there's an iron rest and a mouse trap there. Um, here's a beautifully rendered uh, pitcher with that protective outer webbing, weaving. Uh, the museum also did a great job of showing, kind of depicting the processes that I had had to figure out from looking at those photographs in the wire book. I had really tried to decipher and un, you know, kind of work backward from those things. So there are some beautiful renderings in the museum. Um, also some great uh, photographs showing the different decorative techniques. And these, uh, the decorative techniques kind of emerged out of this functional thing as people had more leisure time, as they had more resources, as they had more encouragement from their culture to make things that were um, purchasable and um, you know, memorable, they, would, they, they did it. You know, they, they made picture frames, they started embellishing uh, different kinds of functional wear. These are some cake racks and iron rusts. Um, they started embellishing other things. Instead of just making that protective cage, they would make an elegant lacy rim for um, uh, dishes. And um, the museum also showcased this kind of really significant moment in uh, the history of wire working, which happened in 1944, and it was right at the end of the war, and um, somebody had this great idea to kind of bust out and make a bunch of wire work to celebrate this tradition that had almost withered away, and they had an exhibition in the museum there, and the theme was uh, fairy tales and kind of fantasy stories. So here you see a dragon, you see some pheasants, you see uh, the uh, drotar, the, wire, the tinkerer on the right, and the apprentice right there in the center. Um, you see a princess and an owl. And they're really just uh, going over the top. You see this uh, kind of curly, uh, it's it's basically if you if you wrap like a spring around a dowel and then pull it off and then stretch it out it makes this kind of cursive e shape and that's what's filling in her garment so they were really showing what they had showing all the technical expertise that they had um, and really the the apex is this kind of gold decorative um, these bowls and they're, they're really, they don't go outside of this. They're these brass, but golden colored uh, containers. And um, they were also used in the home, but very, very labor intensive. And finally into the present day where um, these techniques, you know, they, they really stuck around. People, what I, what I came to realize is that the techniques and the ideas around this practice were really part of this a nationalist identity. And um, you had to do it the same way over and over again. You'd see people show up for these um, kind of city fairs and they would show up to their booth and they would all have the same kind of work. They'd all be doing the same kind of curly, you know, loopy spiral uh, stuff, which is, absolutely gorgeous, but really um, not where my heart was. You know, as a contemporary artist, I was interested in it, but it felt like all the research had been done, like people knew how to do that. That was a story that had been told. And I, I was really looking for things that were um, more about what, what is our story now? Um, there were some glimmers of that in uh, a couple of, there was a traveling show from the museum that was in another city, and there were a couple of contemporary artists who were featured there, like this piece, which is partly ceramic and partly wire. Um, and I started feeling like, well, there's got to be, there's, there's something out there more. 
And as I started looking, I started finding some information about three artists who I just want to give you a quick overview of who were really leading the way for thinking about wire specifically in a contemporary way. Um, Remigia Biskupska, uh, you can tell when she was working, <laughs> really, from these photos. Um, she was self-taught. She was self-taught and pushed that uh, envelope a little bit. She did not ascribe to the tradition and the functional wear. She was really thinking about how this wire related to jewelry and, and moving in that direction. Um, also being very experimental with what she was making, not just making necklaces and earrings, but making things that could be worn on different parts of the body. And um, so you can still see a real information, a, a source of information coming from her uh, background being adjacent to wire working or the tradition, but a lot of experimentation. Um, I had the great privilege to meet and spend a couple of days with Blanka Sperkova, and her last name, Sperkova, means uh, jewelry maker. Sperki is uh, jewelry in Slovak. She, um, she was born in what is now Slovakia, but at the time was Czechoslovakia and now lives in Brno. And um, the thing that was interesting to me about her work was that she was really bucking any kind of uh, adhesion to these traditional ways of working. And this, I, I can't even, <laughs> I wish I could blow your minds more with this, but uh, this work that she does is, you know, these little beads are about that long and they are hand woven. They are not finger knit. They're not knit with knitting needles, but it looks like knitting. and. I didn't ever get a chance to see her working, but she showed me her studio. And um, so she was, she'd been working for a long time. She had been an animator. She had been a graphic designer. She came up during the 60s and was a, just a real iconoclast in the art, you know, in the art world. She was friends with and married to and lovers with all these people she was telling me about. Um, and she, had the craziest sense of humor um, about her work. And I felt like that was another thing that I was really looking for, was this kind of um, ex expansion beyond this self-serious way of thinking about the, the traditional trotarstvo. Um, she also was not afraid to show kind of references to art, and she was informed by art, high art, fine art, uh, Western art canon in her artwork. So this is a neck piece, and um, you can tell where the influence is. And then she was also unafraid to take in other kinds of influences. She had a whole body of work that was um, her wire work on top, her grandchild's artwork on the bottom. So the grandchild would generate an image and she would translate it into wire. And they had a lot of shows together all around the Czech Republic. And um, lastly in this section, uh, Zuzana Graus Rudavska, um, another figure who was very much a part of a, an art family lineage in Slovakia. Her parents were both very well-known artists. And she was featured in Arlene Fish's Textile Techniques in Metal book. And I had seen her work before. Again, really interested. Oh, there's a Slovak there. Um, and she happened to have a show at the Institut Francais in Bratislava when I got there. So uh, again, um, not adhering to traditional techniques and really incorporating a bunch of different uh, objects, a lot of stones, natural uh, semi-precious stones. But what I loved about her work th was that it was interested in the ways that the wire could work beyond itself and casting a shadow. I mean, for anybody who's, it's, it's one of the loveliest parts of working with wire is lighting it. And um, she had really capitalized on the space 
in there and also had just made work that was beautiful in its rendering, but not really that beautiful in the technique. And so she was using this idea to convey, an, could, she was using the technique to convey an idea, which I also thought was an interesting contemporary way of thinking. This is one of her jewelry pieces. And another one. Thinking about it in context, she took this photo of the work on asphalt um, and thinking about it where, where there was context you know, in the environment. So a lot of the things that I uh, really ended up gravitating toward were things that were not mainstream. They were not things that were in the kind of the academic vein of looking at tinkering in Slovakia. And they were things that related to other, other parts of being an observer. Um, I, this is from the, um, the National Gallery in Bratislava, uh, which just opened after having been closed for quite a while. And they had a really lovely, and there were a lot of moments where I felt like people were looking at things and asking good questions. And um, they hadn't finished the construction on the gallery, but they had taken the opportunity to uh, kind of narrate that and encourage people to develop critical thinking skills along the way. So I really found myself looking for evidence. Um, I arrived in Slovakia. Uh, it was, you know, when the war broke, broke out in Ukraine, I was pretty convinced that I would not be going to Slovakia because I really didn't know where it was. I didn't know the influences. I didn't know anything about it. I, I, I really struggled over finding a coat because I was afraid that the place where I was living wasn't going to have heat. I didn't, I really had no clue about anything. So when I got there, uh, it was shocking to me. I mean, lots of things were new. I, I felt like uh, this was in a, um, a convent. This is the first night that I was in uh, Bratislava when I arrived and I had found this place on Airbnb and it, it literally is, it's a, it's a lived in convent and you can stay there too. Um, and I was up a lot of the night and I was just, astounded at the way that um, here I was in a space and I was in a space that had been lived in and in, and was being engaged in daily by people and um, it seems like such an obvious thing but to be shocked into a new situation and then to be shocked into a new culture and a place where you didn't speak the language I really was relegated to looking at things, and this is in the middle of winter, you know, the end of January. Um, a lot of the things that I did at first were walking around in the street and looking in or at windows, looking for evidence, looking for what kinds of things were people valuing, what kinds of things were people um, saving. This is a what I came to understand uh, was a storage unit in Jelena. And initially I took this picture because of this, this wire up here, but you can see there's a car in the window. I had no idea what this place was. It looked so run down and ramshackle, but there were uh, lots and lots of objects. What people, what people kept, what was of value? Um, I found myself looking up I found myself trying to decipher what was um, what was happening in you know if if anybody's been in one of the programs that I've a field trip or a creative aging program and we talk about what's going on <laughs> in this picture, I ask myself that all the time. And um, this is a fence. This is a traditional Slovak fence gate, and it's made out of blanks from um, machine parts that were cut out of the, you can see it's the negative space around that. Um, what kinds of things were being, were valued? What, were, what was being saved? What was being torn down? 
wasn't always clear. Um, there were moments of extraordinary beauty. I, I look at this still and I just think, I remember seeing it for the first time. It's a suet bag um, and made out of a grocery fruit, um, you know, plastic thing. And there were moments of real intention. This is at the Rosenfeld's Palatz in Jelena, which was a home of a Jewish banking couple. The bank was on the ground floor and their residence was up on top. And now it's a cultural center where you can go and um, you can go for free, which is a lot of what you could do. What's being repaired? What's, what's valued? I love that there were all these buildings that were in some, in some sort of flux in Bratislava. This is um, one that was being repaired. There are, um, I think per, uh, not per capita, but um, in Slovakia, there's, there are more castles in Slovakia than any other European country per square kilometer. Um, and a lot of them are privately owned and in a very slow state of repair. Another view. Um, I, I became aware of how important it was that I be there in Slovakia, that I be moving my body, that I be exploring. And um, this was one of the places that I was fortunate to go. I and mean, this is a really great kind of emblematic view of this region with the mountains and the valley and the castle. And um, how moving my body and how the idea of wire working and using your body to make something uh, was embedded in this culture. Um, this is a montage of work by um, Maria Bartusova, who was a, an artist who worked with blind or partially sighted and visually impaired students. And you can see them holding her work, which um, was mostly made of cast plaster in condoms and balloons. and. Um, but using this idea of, I mean, a, she was an artist who predated this work or my work, but thinking about this, you know, the body and how people use their senses. Um, this is a dance troupe from Bratislava made entirely of people over 50 <laughs> and, and uh, just a really moving expression of, again, moving, using the body and thinking about connection, about communication, and again, the idea of repair. So uh, a little bit about what I did and um, was looking at. I, as I said, I, I didn't speak Slovak. I spoke a couple of things. Uh, I made a practice every day of when I was walking to work saying to every single person that I passed, uh, Dobry dien, which is hello. Um, and it just really got good at that <laughs> and uh, shocked some people because it's not, you don't say hello to everybody, but um, <laughs> I also got uh, really good at asking for my uh, room key at the university, which I had to, you had to go to an office and talk to a person, ask for your key each day, and then turn it in at the end of the day. So, I'd say, Tristo Trinast is AC. 313, um, but I didn't speak the language, so I was really hungry for visual information and, and really trying to decipher, like clues, trying to make a story. And I was lucky to have a stack of magazines, design magazines, left in my office. And so for the first few weeks, pawed through those and found this amazing work by um, Svetlar Midlo, who was a graphic designer, thinking about um, this kind of confluence of graphic gestures, um, this kind of calligraphic stroke, this, um, these, the bird, the little fleur-de-lis, the weaving, all these things kind of tied into an image of a man with a belt and this kind of really made me think of tinkering. So this, this way that there was this kind of um, almost calling back, this call and response to things that had happened. 
in the past. And as I was walking around and looking, I kept finding evidence of you know, this really beautiful approach to language, and it was accessible to me. I didn't have to understand what was written here to benefit from some of what was happening on this power box. I also didn't have to speak this language to understand that there was this kind of impulse, this decorative impulse that called back to, to wire working. I mean, I don't, think it's a, I don't think it's an accident. And I was really drawn to the, what is the most elemental thing here that I can make sense of and that somebody else can make sense of. And I, I started thinking about language as this thing that hangs between people that's, uh, you know, you are a participant in communicating. And I was finding that as I struggled to make myself understood, if somebody was really excited about trying to understand me and we were in it together, we didn't always need a lot of shared verbal language. We could figure it out. We could get somewhere together. So, I went back to this pl happy place of mine, which was first grade and learning how to write cursive and doing those exercises um, where you're just doing this kind of repetition. And I think you know, cognitive research has shown that that is really helpful to people, that it that helps you remember things. It helps you think of, uh, you know, like connect ideas. So, I really tried to bring it back to the most elemental thing and apply the idea of wire working on, on top of that. So a lot of what I did in Slovakia was really not the actual building, it was testing. Um, so all of the things that I did there were test pieces and really um, like the most basic hardware store materials and the most basic kind of rendition of this. but. Um, here I made an O to where, and um, started thinking about how the, this language could inhabit a similar sp space to wearable art. Um, this is a, the letter A, and um, also experimenting with that as an idea. Um, this is. This is where, you know, we talk about a starting point. This is another starting point. It's, it was the end of a time that I was exploring, but um, definitely deep rooting for uh, work to come in the future. And I think going back to this idea of what are the, what are the qualities of the drotar or what are the qualities that really spoke to me at the beginning of, you know, before I went, um, they were this idea of um, creative use of materials, that, that idea of scrapping, or the idea of um, using what's available to you and making something beautiful. There was the idea of um, connecting with people, this kind of, uh, I'm gonna expand beyond my roots and I'm going to come back and I'm gonna share that. I, that was something that was really important to me, thinking about gathering information, having experiences, and bringing those back to share with my community here. Um, but in the end, I think the most important thing and the thing that's really enduring and, and the hardest thing is this idea of repair. And um, the idea of repair being something that manifests in the artwork as a tangible thing, but the idea of repair as being so critical to where we are as a global society and how um, I, I love this piece of street art from Bratislava, which is super, uh, you know, it's, it's beautiful and it's extraordinary pol extraordinarily political. Um, there's a movement afoot right now in Slovakia to outlaw um, LGBTQ plus communities. Um, there is also a movement afoot to defund art. Um, the Art Gallery in Bratislava just received notice that all of their national funding was, was just this week. Um, they, they did not receive any money. Um, so uh, this idea of repair 
is something that's really uh, up front for Slovaks. It's up front for us. Um, the idea of having freedom of speech. Um, this is, again, the first day I was in Bratislava. I found this poster. It was a series of posters about democracy, human rights, freedom of speech, freedom of the press. And um, it is absolutely inflammatory, absolutely critical conversation. And um, so I do think that in spite of all the meandering, all the new ideas, all the new exposure, and the kind of um, diversion from my original intent, that the, the core of what I am talking about really is the same thing that I started out being interested in, which is this idea that um, making something better, leaving something better, um, it's, it's hard work. Uh, and uh, I think we get a chance every day to try and do that and, um, and doing it as funky or as beautifully as possible is really um, the end and the beginning. So thank you so much. So do you have any questions? <laughs> I, I have, I, I really do have a bunch of other, I, I have so many pictures and um, I really wanna talk about all of them and they all have stories and they all could be arranged and rearranged in different ways and be springboards and references to different kinds of things. Um, I. I think one of the things that I have pledged to work on is compiling those photographs into a book. I mean, this is one of the things that will help me sort through my experience and also kind of prove the point of art being at the center of this conversation. And I do think that, um, that art really has the power to, to do that and to inspire ideas, uh, to challenge us, to, um, and to help us make sense of the world, so. The, oh, so the question is, did I speak with the people in Slovakia? And that's, it is a great question because I have, you know, in a lot of European countries, you can kind of get by with, a, a little bit of English and um, trying to use your English words that sometimes have overlaps with Romance languages. Um, you can even do that in Scandinavian countries where there's an overlap. But uh, in Slovak, Slovak is a really different language. So I had experiences, um, the most memorable was when I was trying to send my boxes of books home at the end of my stay and I went to the post office and I, d I failed <laughs> utterly. There was a ticket machine in the doorway that I, you were supposed to read the instructions and take a ticket that would let you get in line because there would be a little LED sign with your number up on it. But I just walked in, I didn't, you know, with my boxes. And, and then I went over to one of the windows and tried to talk in English. <laughs> I said, my, my standard, line, which was, I speak a little bit of, of um, Slovak, can you help me? And uh, they did not speak any English. And I did, I could not, I could not do it. So it ranged from that to people who were really interested in practicing their language um, and speaking English and really working on it. But I found that there was kind of a national shyness about speaking English. And I felt like it was returned by me, my shyness about speaking Slovak. But um, there were, people were uncomfortable when they didn't speak perfect English and then wouldn't make an overture to speak. So um, yeah, that's a, it's a great question. But I practiced, I had some really great people to practice with who humored me. But, and then they would say, they, you know, you, you say something and it sounds convincing enough that they'll just start talking to you and, and then you're lost again, so. 
ja. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the question is uh, the repair jobs that I saw that were that felt like found art. Um, this is another thing that was a really big learning lesson for me where I there were a lot of these fences, a lot of chain link fences that had been hand repaired in a real kind of we're going to get this thing done manner. Um, and in particular, there, this was on my street and there was another one on my street. And I, one day I saw the people who lived at the house where the other one was. And I said my little line in Slovak and they kind of, I said, I'd, I'd like to make a repair for your fence. And I, I really embarrassed them by saying that because I had shown a light on this thing that was not new, that was not um, decorative or beautiful in a way, which was not my intention. I, I thought that it was, I thought I was offering something as a, you know, an act of generosity, like the tinkers, you know, I'm coming from door to door with my, my skill set. And, um, and, and it was shortly before I left, I did end up making a little patch for them and I left it in an envelope in there you know, with a little note that I translated on Google Translate um, and uh, said that I hoped that they would accept the intent with which it was intended. But um, I do think that there is this, you know, like visible mending. I, I think that that's a really, I, I'm still very interested in it, but I would go about it in a different way. I think I would not be so presumptive as to think that, oh, everybody wants my beauty, uh, you know, slathered onto their situation. So, um, so yeah, I, it's definitely interesting. I'm still, I, I, I work in that way. I gravitate toward that kind of aesthetic, but yeah. Yeah, Rita. Oh, that's a, another good question. And this is one of my next talks, I think. <laughs> the people of Jelena. Um, I will, so I'll answer that kind of backward. I, for the Fulbright, they do not arrange for your lodging. You have to find your own lodging. And so I spent a lot of time prior to my departure trying to figure out how to, how to do that. I mean, the, I didn't speak Slovak, I didn't know, I, I knew nothing, but I did know a little bit about Airbnb. And um, <laughs> there, was, there was one place on Airbnb that was so much less expensive and really looked charming, like not, it didn't look um, like it had brand new furniture. A lot of things were very slick and um, cheap and new. This was looked very comfortable, it was in a basement but uh, it was it looked great, and I ended up living there for the entire time I was there, and totally fortuitously, it was in the basement of the home up above where the director of the cultural center in the town where I, in Jelena, <laughs> lived. And um, so I'm gonna pause there, I'll go back to the museum piece, which was the museum, was really on this beautiful grounds, a park with the castle. It was kind of a destination for weddings and photo shoots and, you know, picnics and things like that. Um, that museum was not really like a central location. It wasn't a cultural hub, but the cultural center was. And it was a two part cultural center. One was in a little, uh, an active train station, about a three minute walk from where I was living. And the other one was in a re, um, uh, renovated synagogue that had gone through several iterations as a college lecture hall, a storage unit, a movie theater. And it was, it had been re, um, appointed in the, it had been restored in the top level 
to the original, it was a Peter Barron's um, construction, so as a synagogue with the Star of David and this beautiful dome, and then down below as a white cube gallery, uh, uh, just white walls and a gallery space. And the two sites were absolutely the thing that um, was, it saved me being there. Um, the first week I was there, I went to a dance performance in the train station version, um, and it moved me so hard that I bought a year-long membership. And that, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, that enabled me to go for free anytime I wanted to anything, movies, concerts, I saw amazing music, amazing dance. Um, they were doing, oh, you would have loved it. Uh, they were doing, I mean, you saw that picture of the troop from um, Bratislava of the over 50 dancers. A lot of contemporary dance because they had a curator who brought in dance troops. That was her job. Um, a lot of Czech contemporary dance. Um, there was one that was about being queer and uh, the relationship to soccer or football culture and how um, antagonizing that is for queer culture. And it, the dance was, was, it was two rows of people, one on either side of the dance, uh, of the performance space, and they were the opposing teams and the fans from the opposing teams, and they would shout out different moves for the dancer to do, and he would do those moves. They were soccer moves, so anyway. Uh, <laughs> The, the cultural center was really, really critical to um, my time there. And uh, yeah, that, so that, that is really worth another conversation. It was, um, it's, there are a lot of parallels between that and BIMA. There are a lot of parallels between um, really community building strategies. And um, yeah, it was, it was great. Yeah. Yeah, Martha. Mm, those are great and related questions. Uh, the, the answer to the question about young people being more willing to, uh, uh, less shy about speaking English is yes, they were way more willing to talk and, the, um, and willing to, I think they were willing to be curious but they were also way more facile with English because as it turned out, uh, online gaming is a really good way to learn English and also you can totally tell when somebody's learned it there because they uh, have the saltiest comfort they have the saltiest <laughs> way of speaking um, but uh, they were also more inclined to think about not being in Slovakia or traveling and that was the other thing about people not speaking English is that Americans were really I was one of the only Americans in this um, city of 83,000 people, um, the just not a lot of Americans there. And I mean, shockingly few, <laughs> honestly. Um, and so at the time I was there, it was the beginning of, so the government had just, um, parliament had just had a vote of no confidence. Um, there was writing on the wall about what was going to happen with the election, and it actually has happened. They have a new, new and old um, prime minister who is uh, very right wing. So there's a lot of anti American sentiment there. And um, I did feel like the language and the interest in being a global or the capacity for being a global citizen was, was really related. Clarence. Um, 
Uh, well, I, I, took, I was really so happy to not drive for five months. I got everywhere by walking or um, riding the train mostly, and then at the end riding a bike for a little bit, but mostly walking. Um, and like I said, that was part of the practice. Part of it was learning how to be on foot, and so I, I, walked, I walked a lot. Um, I didn't have to take a train to work. I, um, the university was about a half hour walk from where I was living, so I would get up in the morning, walk to the university. Uh, I would go in to my office, and I was saying to somebody the other day, I, I walked in there the first day, and I turned on the lights, and I was getting all settled, and somebody came by, and they're like, oh, you know, the lights are on. <laughs> and, um, because energy cost is exceptionally high. And uh, that really was I, I, another cultural faux pas right out of the box. So I would go um, not turn on my lights and uh, leave the door open because I was always hoping that people would see me working in there and stop by. And I, it, it really didn't happen all that much. I had a lot of time to myself. Um, I was, I had a connection with the Erasmus program, which is, uh, it's a broad um, exchange program. It's like a study abroad, university-based study abroad program that's not just in Europe, but it's, it's really heavily utilized in Europe. And so my connection to the university was the Erasmus um, supervisor. And so she and I would go to lunch every once in a while, and they had a cafeteria and soup. You'd get soup. Yes. <laughs> um, lots of soup. And um, I mean, there are some amazing, amazing soups also, but insti <laughs> in institutional, institutional university soup is um, memorable. There's a, I, I think we can get the, it's like a, bull, a powdery bouillon that you can get here also, like Maggie is, um, or Maggi, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. But, um, so go to lunch, work some more. I was doing a lot of research. I was going to the public library. Um, I was walking again, trying to get to know the community and where I was situated. And, um, and then I would go home and I would go to the grocery store because grocery stores are every couple of blocks. And um, I had a fridge that was about that big. So uh, I would cook. I, I found a, they had little free libraries there and I found a, a really excellent Slovak cookbook and I, um, would cook recipes from the cookbook, and uh, then I would do more research. I would, I was, I had one leg there and one leg here. I was trying to keep in touch with my family and uh, my partner, and um, so it was. Yeah, that was that was a, a typical day. But then there were de travel days. So. Oh my gosh, that is. Another great question, what are the streets like? What do you walk on? Everything. <laughs> it's, um, it's not just like a neat paved sidewalk. You really have to watch out that you, there are some parts of the sidewalk that are tile and then there are parts of tiles that are propped up and missing and um, it was a really, uh, it was very different surface to be walking on and there was always some sort of construction always some sort of, um, you know, it, was, it really was something was open and then it was closed because it was cordoned off because of a political action or because of some sort of renovation. So um, it was, you walk on everything. Yeah. yeah, they're marked like regular, regular city. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, you have str uh, plaques, on the corners, like you'd recognize from Italy and you know those kind of street names that are put up right on the building a lot of times. Um, the layout of the city was very understandable because the cathedral and the, you know, the, there was a center square, two squares in the center of the city and then there were radiating rings that went out and then there were spokes that went out from there. So it was, once you got the hang of that, it was easy to, to find your way around. Yes.
Hmm. Oh gosh, how, how has the journey changed me as a person? Uh, when I went, I was really, really in need of some um, refinding myself. And uh, I think over the course of my adult life, for sure, there have been moments where I've found myself and then I've lost myself and found myself and, and gotten occupied with something else. And it, when I applied for this, uh, fellowship, it, it dawned on me that it had been 30 years that I had been thinking about trying to make that trip. And so um, it was kind of, it was one of those things that I felt like, all right, if I don't try this, and there was no guarantee that, I mean, it was a huge honor to be selected for this fellowship. And so if I didn't try it, then I would really be, um, missing an opportunity for my my own self. So I think what came out of it was um, that combined with a reminder that I don't have to, I mean, you know, post pandemic, I think during the pandemic, I really suffered from being alone a lot of the time. And it was really easy for me to be alone. But then I developed some kind of bad habits that I'm still trying to undo about being self-conscious and uncertain and you know all those things th like the demons come in and so forcing myself to be every day I had to learn I tried to learn more than just uh Dobry Dien. I tried to learn I had to go to the tailor once I had to do that all in Slovak so I would try to learn things being bold um being unafraid to ask for help or offer you know, so I think it it reminded me of um, some of the good things that I have to offer. Yeah, Wendy. Yeah. The so the question is, did, how did it impact my artwork and um, I don't know the answer yet because I haven't really I, I came home and it took me a long time to unpack my suitcase for one thing so um, I haven't really dug into what will come from this but I do know that again kind of pandemic related I, I think I felt really short on ideas and I felt like I, I didn't, I, I had COVID twice and I think it really impacted my um, cognitive processes for a while. Um, and so there was a lot of fallow time then and I think that it made me remember, oh yeah, you, you liked, to do that, <laughs> like uh, this is something that um, satisfies both the impulse to create and also the impulse to think about something. And I think, actually, now that I say all that, I, I think the way that it really does hone in on something different is that I I'm really lit up about the idea of the body, the sensory body, and how that relates to my what I make in an object way or in a thinking way or so um, I we just had a meeting of the look again program here at the beginning of last month and that's the group of folks with early stage memory loss and their care partners and we have been meeting for for a while a few years now and I brought a little kit of objects um, like a touch kit and um, we just I said you're gonna be my test group here <laughs> and, and we got them out and we handed them around and told stories or made observations and um, I think that there's something really rich not just for the creative aging community but for the making community for uh, people you know like connecting with physical things, having art as the center, you know, art as the 
instead of having a conflict between two people, you can actually displace some of that conversation in, a, in an art conversation. You can both have points of view and you can share them and they can be embedded in this thing. So I, I think that it just made me feel like, oh, all of this is connected again. It seems like a great place to stop. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs>